Welcome to Phoenix Masonry Live, a show that brings you talented Freemasons, Masonic authors, artists, craftsmen, historians, and brothers of accomplishment. I am Frederick L. Milliken, Executive Director of Phoenix Masonry, and we are here to celebrate our Freemasonry. That's what we do at Phoenix Masonry. We celebrate our Freemasonry. And I'm here celebrating today with Brother Nathan Tweedy from broadcasting from the Baseball Hall of Fame. Welcome, Brother Nathan. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. And we're going to kick this off with a little music for Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Okay, we're back, and uh, Brother Nathan Tweedy. Uh, it's Tweedy, right? Correct, Tweedy, yeah. Okay, um, let me pronounce that right. Uh, Brother T Tweedy was raised September 2016 in Ot Otsego Lodge. I pronounce that right? Otsego. Otsego, <laughs> number 138, Cooperstown, New York. Um, he has four generations of Masonic members on his mother's side. His mother was past matron of, of the Order of Eastern Star. Consequently, Brother Nathan spent a lot of time in the Masonic temple as a child. He is current senior master of ceremonies and historian for its Cisco Lodge. He is also current junior deacon of Delaware River Lodge number 439. Delhi, New York. And pending approval by the Grand Master, he is area, he will be area historian for the Central Leatherstocking District of New York. Brother Nathan is, uh, has a Bachelor of Arts in History from Hartwick College, Oneonta, New York, uh, a member of the Hartwick College varsity baseball team. He has a Master's of Science in American History. He is a member of the New York State Baseball Umpires Association. He is a member of SABR, Society for American 
baseball research. He is manager of on-site learning for the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. And he is the owner operator of Two Pillars Apparel, a business that focuses on sports themed Masonic apparel and pins. Well, welcome again, uh, Brother Tweedy. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really, uh, really looking forward to talking about some baseball today. All right. And uh, I'm looking forward to it too. I've got, uh, I've got my, uh, it's a Boston Celtics hat, but I got my, at least I got a baseball hat on. I got my glove and my ball, and I've got my Boston Red Sox water bottle here, and I'm all ready to talk some baseball. So let me ask you, uh, Nathan, what led to you to research connections between baseball and masonry? Uh, so uh, as the manager of on-site learning here at the Hall of Fame, I work with school groups that come on their field trips to visit us here in Cooperstown. Uh, and many of those groups do research in our Giamatti Research Center. Um, so we have a player file on every player that it's ever recorded one out in the field defensively or recorded one at bat at the major league level, as well as lots of subject folders. Uh, and as going through the subject folders with a teacher looking over as two separate words, so that's now one word fixed properly in our archives. Uh, but I, I was curious to see what was in this folder, so I came back to it when I had some free time and found some clippings of different Masonic softball and baseball leagues throughout the country. But what really caught my attention was a piece written by Brother Jerry Erickson out of uh, the Grand Lodge of California. Brother Erickson made it his hobby to find all the Masons involved in baseball, uh, be it as a player or a scout, a broadcaster, owner, executive, pretty much anyone involved in baseball at the major or minor league level, Brother Erickson uh, wanted to record that and uh, let us know who they were. Now on that list, he had anyone who was a member of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum bolded. And I was shocked to see how many were bolded on that document. Uh, however, it was from the uh, 1970s. So I had to update it a little bit. And by the time I got it up to 2017's uh, induction class, I had 59 Masons that are members of the Hall of Fame. So uh, that piqued my interest quite a bit. <laughs> how many members are there in the Baseball Hall of Fame and how many of them are Freemasons? Yeah, so there are currently 59, possibly a 60th. I'm still waiting on Lefty Grove to see if there's any uh, actual Masonic uh, background there. Uh, but at least 59 are Masons of the current 317. This summer that will change to 323 with our class of six coming in at the end of July. <laughs> Um, but that takes us at 18.2% of all current Hall of Famers are, in fact, uh, Brother Masons. Wow, that's an impressive percentage. Why do you think the number of Hall of Famers is so high? Well, uh, there's a few reasons. Uh, if you look at the peak years of numbers of Masonry, uh, I believe the uh, MSA says that the highest year was 1950 for the number of Masons in the United States. That coincides pretty closely with the peak years for baseball, so you're going to pick up a few guys there. Uh, but also I think it really comes down to the fact that these men were traveling regularly for work. In a 162-game season, which is what they currently play, you're playing half of those on the road, uh, so they can have a sense of family even when they're away from their family at home. Uh, but also masonry and baseball share a lot of a common history, a lot of common symbols, and uh, I think there's a lot of familiarity there between masonry and baseball. Um, there are so, a lot of famous uh, uh, Masonic baseball players on this list. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost overwhelmed by it for there the, for a minute. Uh, I'd like to go over a few of them. I, you, you know, you can't mention all, what is it, 59 of them here. But some of them, you know, stand out to me personally. Uh, I've been a baseball fan for a long time. Uh, Ernie Banks, Bob Feller, Jimmy Fox, Rogers Hornsbury. Eddie Matthews, third baseman for the Milwaukee Brewers. Willie Mays, uh, Sam Rice, George Sisler, Tris Speaker, Onus Wagner, Cy Young. Also some famous people, and they were great baseball players. 
Have you any uh, interesting stories of baseball players in their Freemasonry or something you would share, share with us about them? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so the two greatest hitters of all time, uh, the greatest righty and greatest lefty, were both Masons. Uh, Ty Cobb is the uh, best hitting lefty of all time, the best hitting righty of all time being Rogers Hornsby. And both men actually have their Shriner fezes as part of our collection here at the Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame has about 40,000 three artifacts. And in that 40,000, we have two shrine pheasants. Uh, so uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, but Rogers Hornsby has one of, my favorites, uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time relating to baseball. Um, he famously quoted saying, people ask me what I do in winter when there's no baseball. I'll tell you what I do. I wait and stare out the window and wait for spring. Uh, so that's his most famous quote. But I think uh, a quote that most Masons would quite enjoy that comes from his uh, biography uh, called My War with Baseball. Uh, <clears throat> he got into a disagreement with the uh, owner of the St. Louis Browns, Donald Barnes. Uh, Barnes had refused to let Hornsby repay a debt to Barnes uh, with money that Hornsby had won at the horse track. Um, Barnes believed that gambling was immoral and therefore refused to take the money, to which Hornsby replied, that money is as good as the money you take from women uh, and, sorry, take from people in the loan shark business. Uh, it's better than the interest from widows and orphans. Uh, so I think a interesting quote there to really bring back to uh, Hornsby's Masonic. Uh, he, uh, in an argument with the owner of the team, uh, went back to talking about how the fair treatment of widows and orphans is important to him. It is worth noting he wasn't a, an orphan himself, but his mother was a widow. Uh, Hornsby was uh, orphaned at the, or not orphaned, sorry, his mother became a widow at the age of, Hornsby was the, at the age of two. Uh, and uh, this caused him and his family to move. Uh, Hornsby and his five older siblings all took jobs in the meatpacking plant. Uh, so Hornsby started working at the age of 10, which I can't even imagine. He was able to lift his family out of uh, poverty by uh, becoming a baseball player. So. Uh -huh. Are there any baseball games played in Cooperstown by major or minor league teams? So there used to be the... Um, Hall of Fame class, uh, sorry, the uh, Hall of Fame game, which was an exhibition game played between major league teams. Uh, this goes back to 1939 when the Hall of Fame opened. The first game after the opening of the Hall of Fame was between the New York Yankees and their affiliate, the uh, Newark Bears. Uh, most notably missing from the lineup for the Yankees that day was Lou Gehrig, as uh, they were just a few, few weeks shy of his famous um, luckiest man speech. Uh, but uh, today, uh, there is not a major league game or minor league game that is played at Doubleday Field. However, uh, the Hall of Fame does have a Hall of Fame Classic every Memorial Weekend. Uh, it's played on the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend. And uh, all 30 teams are represented by a former major leaguer. Uh, so in the last three years, we've had players like uh, Michael Kadire, um, uh, oh, geez, blanking on a few of the other names. But we've had some pretty big names come through. Um, the last few years, you know, guys who retired just two, three years ago, and uh, every major league team is represented, so it's a pretty fun weekend, and uh, get all the players out there and get to root for your favorite team, and we, uh, this year we had six Hall of Famers out on the field as well. Um, Ozzie Smith is usually the captain of the Wizards, and the other team uh, is captained and managed by, uh, usually by Phil Necro, uh, called the Nuxkies. So. Uh, that's the closest we get to a major league game today, um, but uh, hopefully we get some minor league games back soon. All right. Your lodge, 138, is the only Masonic lodge in Cooperstown. Yes. Have any Hall of Famers been members of your lodge? Unfortunately, no. We haven't had any members of our lodge in Cooperstown. Uh, the closest we've had, and I'm still checking on the records on this one, I'm yet to find him in any records that I've come across, um, but I did come across a second-hand account stating that uh, there was a Hall of Famer who was a member of a lodge in Oneonta, which is about 30 miles away, uh, but I think that was just a typo, so I'm not going too deep into that one. Uh, but it is worth noting that uh, while we haven't had any Hall of Famers uh, that I know of visit us while we uh, uh, were open in Lodge and we haven't had any members that uh, they've all seen the Lodge uh, if they've been to Cooperstown because uh, they go right past it on their Hall of Fame parade from Doubleday Field to the Hall of Fame. All right. Well, besides the previously mentioned connections, what connections do baseball and masonry share? Uh, so 
Uh, if we start with the origins of baseball, uh, according to the Doubleday myth, uh, baseball was founded or created at what is today Doubleday Field uh, by uh, Abner Doubleday in 1839, so a full century prior to the opening of the Hall of Fame. So that's why if you look at those 1939 uniforms, you'll see the centenary of baseball patch on the sleeve. Um, and that was part of that celebration was the opening of the Hall of Fame and Museum here in Cooperstown. Uh, but turns out that's not actually true. But going with that story, though, of Doubleday inventing baseball in Cooperstown, he invented it in, like I said, where today Doubleday Field is. And at the time, that was a cow pasture known as Finney's Farm. And Finney's Farm uh, was named after uh, Elihu Finney. And brother Elihu Finney was the first master of Otsego Lodge. So uh, while Elihu Finney may not have played a role in the founding of baseball, he did play a role in the founding of masonry here in Cooperstown, which is uh, pretty fun. Um, but there is... Uh, there's a, a, quite a few people out there who believe that uh, baseball is a Masonic conspiracy. Uh, there's, you go ahead and take a look on, on YouTube, you'll find some interesting videos. And one of those is arguing that Abner Doubleday was in fact a member of the fraternity and the inventor of baseball, both of which are actually not true. Uh, we do have several members of the Doubleday family that were members of Otsego Lodge. Uh, however, none of them were uh, him. They were relatives um, who lived in the area. Um, but continuing with this idea that Masons invented baseball, there's one person who uh, many people believe who did invent baseball or had the largest hand in the creation of baseball as we know it today. Many believe that to be Alexander Cartwright, uh, who was instrumental in the Knickerbocker rules uh, that were used for that game in the Elysian Fields, which many call uh, the first game used by the, the rules as people would recognize them today. Uh, and that uh, that's not necessarily true as well. Uh, while Court Cartwright was a member of the fraternity and is a brother Mason, he did not become a Mason until after he spread baseball throughout the United States. Uh, he wound up moving to California during the gold rush, trying to uh, make some money out there, and then wound up hopping on a ship uh, and got sick during his uh, voyage and was kicked off the ship in the Hawaiian Islands. He wound up recovering and uh, was made a brother in Hawaii under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of California. Uh, so he was uh, entered, passed, and raised while he was in California. So clearly no Masonic connection there as he did all of his baseball work before he got out there. So, um, so the origin stories of masonry uh, also tie in with that where uh, we all know the story of the Goose and Gridiron in 1717 being where the Grand Lodge of England was founded, which that is definitely the founding of the Grand Lodge of England. There's no argument on that, but that can't be the founding date for masonry because you have to have lodges to join together to form a Grand Lodge. Uh, and there is some documentation showing that uh, Masonic ritual was performed in uh, Scotland prior to 1717. Um, and many believe that uh, base, no, sorry, not baseball, that masonry came out of one of three different fields. Uh, one being the, which I think many are probably familiar with, that uh, when the Templars were driven out of Europe, um, they used secret signs and modes of recognition so they could recognize uh, a member both you know, in the dark as well as uh, if they were able to see them. So they had secret modes of communication. Um, and it's believed that uh, those that driving underground forced them to create a brotherhood that would eventually turn into uh, masonry as we know today. Uh, m another common theory is the operative transition theory that uh, stonemasons uh, using their um, secrets to identify themselves as a master mason or as an apprentice, uh, those modes of recognition were uh, converted and used um, by men of the Enlightenment period into what we know today as Freemasonry. And then finally, uh, the Box Club Charity is a less commonly known one, but I think it's a pretty interesting theory. This is that other, uh, other operative um, trades, such as cobblers or um, coopers, you know, barrel makers, uh, that those trades may not have had their own lodges that would help each other out in times of need. So they would form box club charity where members of those trades would all pitch in funds. And then when a member of those trades uh, suffered an injury or was in need of distress or, uh, or in distress and in need of help, that they would then get funds from those organizations, which sounds pretty similar to some of our Masonic ideals as well. Uh, so those are all three competing theories. Uh, I'm not going to say any of those is correct, but uh, um, yes, yeah, so we've got the the operative transition theory, the box club, and then the uh, the Templar theory. Um, 
which the Templar theory states that uh, when, the Mace, or when the Templars were driven out of Europe, uh, they had secret modes of recognition to identify each other, and those modes of recognition helped to drive them into a secret organization long after the Templar uh, knighthood uh, kind of ceased to exist, and that eventually transitioned into Masonry as we know today. Um, so we both organizations, baseball and masonry, have uh, unknown origins, which is pretty fun and always makes for some interesting speculation, I must say. Um, but also, uh, we both have a, a common history as well of, of segregation uh, here in the United States. Um, I'm sure most are familiar with Prince Hall affiliation. Um, I, I believe, are, are you a member of the Prince Hall uh, Lodge? Yes, I am. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, Prince Hall Masonry, uh, pretty well uh, recognized here in the United States. Uh, do you remember, do you know what the total number is off the top of your head uh, of recognition here in the United States? I'll say 45 uh, say or 40. Uh, how many grand jurisdictions recognize Prince Hall? I believe it's, it's in the mid 40s, I know that. Um, uh, there's only, I think, seven states left. Yeah. That, uh, don't recognize. Yeah, so we're getting pretty close to full recognition here in the US. Uh, but the, the traditional story of uh, Prince Hall Masonry is that uh, men wanted to petition a lodge in Boston. Uh, these were uh, men of color, and uh, they were not granted that, so they uh, joined uh, Masonry through a traveling um, military lodge, uh, just through the Grand Lodge of Ireland, I believe. Um, and uh, so that's the the common the common story. Uh, there's a book that recently came out that kind of challenges that. I don't know if. Uh, your listeners are familiar with um, Landmarks of Our Fathers, which was published in 2016. Uh, this challenges parts of that story, but still um, the basis is still there that the, the original members of uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry could not become members because of the color of their skin and uh, became Masons. And uh, as soon as they could, tried to get uh, uh, recognition through the Grand Lodge of England, which they did succeed in that. And slowly they've been gaining recognition across the United States. So. Um, yeah, so again, it's that whole, uh, we don't quite know even with, with Prince Hall exactly uh, how it was originally founded, which I think is great for, for academic discourse. And I hope we have more research on that coming up soon. But uh, still, so segregation in masonry has a well-established past here in the United States. Uh, and baseball also, as many are familiar, has the Negro, or had the Negro Leagues. Uh, so um, Jackie Robinson, most people know him being the gentleman who broke the color barrier. Now it's worth noting, Jackie Robinson was not a Mason, but uh, the executive who's responsible for integrating baseball, Branch Ricky, was in fact a brother Mason. Uh, so it's nice to know we've got guys who uh, were responsible for helping fix the issue of segregation in baseball. Um, but uh, what a lot of people don't know is that baseball originally wasn't segregated. Uh, right after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, the United States was in a period of flux. This is the period where we see men of color being elected to Congress from states in the Deep South. Uh, and those men, some did serve, some did not actually wind up serving. Uh, and uh, kind of a weird period where we kind of see how the country as a whole is trying to solve these this new racial structure in the United States. Uh, and then in the 1870s and 80s, we start to see the rise of groups like the Ku Klux Klan, we start to see the rise of um, Jim Crow laws, and this leads to what's known as the Nader period, uh, which is the beginning of really strict segregation and uh, discrimination in the United States. Uh, but during that little period before the rise of the Nader is when we see African-American men playing professional baseball. Uh, the first African-American man we know playing professionally, uh, it's worth noting, not the major league level, incidentally, is from here in Cooperstown, which I think is pretty cool since we don't really have a real baseball connection since baseball wasn't invented here. Um, but he played minor league ball uh, and uh, never wanted to make it to the major leagues, but his name is uh, Bud Fowler. It's worth noting that at Double Day Field today, there's a large display denoting uh, the, the history of Bud Fowler and the streets both off of Main Street and off of the State Highway going into Doubleday Fields parking lot are both named Fowler way after him. Uh, but the first major leaguer to be uh, a man of color was Moses Fleetwood Walker. This is as far as we know. I'm not going to say that's a definite, but our records show that he is the first. So if anyone has uh, some earlier, please do bring that uh, information forward. We'd love to have it. Uh, but Moses Fleetwood Walker, as far as we know, uh, first man of color to play Major League Baseball. And... Uh, him and a few others, including his brother Weldy, played at the major league level. Uh, but as we see the rise of the Nader period in the United States, where we see you know segregation occurring 
in large portions of the country. Uh, same thing starts to happen in baseball. We have teams who refuse to play the Toledo Blue Stockings, which is the team that uh, um, Walker played for, and we start to see, um, as a result of that, leagues, the International League was the first that I know of in uh, 1887, uh, so four years after Walker integrates uh, the majors, uh, we see the International Association or the International League as we know it today uh, was the first to have a gentleman's agreement, so no written uh, no written communication, but uh, they agreed they would not renew the contracts of any black ball players. Uh, and that led to a lack of any men of color playing Major League Baseball by 1900, establishes the um, the color barrier that Jackie Robinson famously broke in 1947. Uh, so uh, at that point, teams start forming up teams um, of just men of color playing, and uh, they brainstorm across the country, kind of like what the Harlem Globetrotters do today. They'd go into a community, say, we're here to play. Who wants to play us? And charge admission and put on a pretty good show for the fans. Uh, eventually, uh, one of the men playing for those teams, a man by the name of, um, oh, geez. Totally blanking on his name, uh, but it'll come to me in just a moment. I promise. But anyway, uh, anyway, this uh, uh, one of these guys decides, hey, you know what? We should uh, bring them together. Rube Foster. There we go. Uh, Rube Foster decides, let's bring these teams together and form a league of our own. So, 1920, the Negro National League is founded in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, so, uh, at the YMCA there in Kansas City, Missouri, um, Rube Foster, with the other uh, original members of the Negro National League, founded the league. And that gave men of color an opportunity to play professional baseball at a major league quality and at a major league level, um, even if they couldn't play at the major league level. So uh, I just, as I first got raised, I was learning the history of masonry, and I was working here at the Hall of Fame, and I couldn't help as I'm reading the history of masonry to just be blown away by all the connections that I saw, um, just in the history. So the history itself is pretty impressive. Um, the, the, the common segregation and eventual desegregation of baseball and it seems that uh, recognition between Prince Hall and uh, traditional Grand Lodges here in the U.S. are getting very close to to full recognition um, so hopefully that I hope that gets resolved soon um, and uh, yeah it's, I just find it's really interesting the, uh, the common origins of the, the unknown uh, it's just really interesting. Uh, does the Baseball Hall of Fame include uh, the old Negro Leagues and it, it's uh what, what, what it shows in, in the Hall of Fame? A great question. So it is worth noting, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, the Hall of Fame is actually separate institutions. There's the library, which is where I'm broadcasting from here in the uh, Sealing Center, uh, which is part of the library complex, uh, which is attached to the Hall of Fame. And we lost you there for a minute, so I'll try that again. <laughs> okay, not a worry. Uh, so it's worth noting the Hall of Fame is three separate institutions. There's the library, which I'm broadcasting out of here in the Sealing Center, which is part of the library complex. Uh, then in the, um, there's the Hall of Fame, which most people recognize us as. That is the hall where the plaques of our uh, 317 inductees are uh, hanging. And then there's the museum. And the museum uh, is three floors tall and has a timeline of baseball history and thematic exhibits relating to baseball. And there's a, a display, uh, an exhibit entirely dedicated to the African-American baseball experience, and that's called uh, Pride and Passion. And that is on the museum's second floor, uh, right in the 1920s to 30s portion of the timeline. And uh, the Hall of Fame has uh, 35 players that are inducted strictly for their performance in the Negro Leagues. Most famously is uh, Satchel Paige, who was the first um, the first Hall of Famer inducted strictly on his performance in the Negro Leagues. It's worth noting that Paige did also play in the Major Leagues, but he did meet, not meet the requirements to become a Hall of Famer uh, because of the lack of his service in the Major Leagues for 10 years or more uh, because of the segregation issue. Um, and it's worth noting, too, that a few years earlier, it was Ted Williams who actually... Uh, <laughs> He, in his induction speech, it was a pretty short speech, but most of it was dedicated to the fact that he was upset that the greatest pitcher he ever faced, now keep in mind, this is the greatest hitter to ever live, states that the, the greatest pitcher that he ever faced cannot be in the Hall of Fame because he doesn't meet the requirements for Major League service, and he thought that was a shame. Uh, so he dedicated a large portion of his speech to Satchel Paige and to Josh Gibson, the slugger from the Negro Leagues as well and uh, claiming they need to be in the Hall of Fame. And just a few years later, Satchel Paige was inducted, opening the doors for other Negro leaders. Uh, and in 2006, the Hall of Fame, through its veteran committees, uh, had a committee dedicated just to the Negro Leagues and wanted to do a final sweep of the Negro Leagues to make sure 
anyone who was deserving had a plaque in the Hall of Fame. And that year, there were 17 inductees, uh, 16 of which from the Negro Leagues, the other inductee being Bruce Souter. Uh, so since 2006, we have not had any inductees come in from the uh, Negro Leagues, but um, that does not mean that in the future there won't be a future um, inductee from the Negro Leagues. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity to see Ted Williams play at Fenway Park a number of times, and it was, it was an experience. I have to say I'm quite envious of that one. Okay. Masonry is filled with symbolism and ritualism. Does, does baseball also have that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so um, without going too much into the Masonic symbolism here uh, for various reasons, uh, I'll be a little bit vague on that side of things, and brothers can infer on their own what I mean from that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so every baseball game starts with a ceremonial first pitch, and if you think when a meeting is about to come to order, there's one loud bang uh, from a gavel uh, to bring everyone to uh, to order. So I think that's an interesting little connection, but uh, not definitely not the strongest. Um, if you look at the baseball diamond, uh, the fact that uh, a player will move from home to first to second to third and back to home. There's quite a lot of symbolism in that. Uh, the circumambulation of the diamond, uh, moving from home where you are in a safe location, right? You can't get tagged out while you're at home. Um, and then you move out to the bases where you're a bit more uh, fragile. Uh, you can easily be tagged out uh, if you step off base. But um, if you look at moving through the bases, it's moving through the three separate degrees of masonry. And then as you return back to home or as you finish your uh, uh, return, your um, catechisms after the third degree, right? Uh, you should have that rough ashlar turn into a smooth one. So kind of that, that completion of coming back to an original state uh, is a pretty interesting connection as well. Um, and uh, we have two pillars in every lodge uh, based on jurisdiction. Those may be placed in different locations. Uh, but those two pillars, uh, initially, they may not seem like they have a strong connection to the, uh, the foul poles in baseball. But as you start to look at the symbolism of those uh, pillars and start to think about the actual rule, uh, the role of the, uh, of the foul poles is to you know, keep something within or without. And at least in, in my jurisdiction in New York, that is quite what the symbolism of those, one of the symbols of those pillars is. Uh, you're either within or without of those, those pillars. Uh, so I find that to be quite interesting as well, that uh, um, while they don't serve exactly the same purpose, uh, they do serve, serve a very, very similar purpose. Um, also, you'll notice quite regularly uh, in many jurisdictions, you have the black and white checked floor, uh, and that's a quite common um, a pattern that's mowed into fields. Even here at Doubleday Field, every once in a while, you'll see the crisscross uh, dark and light shade pattern on the on the outfield grass. Um, but I think some of the really interesting symbolism that you see between baseball and um, masonry comes in the formality of a meeting versus the formality of the baseball game. Uh, there's the formal ritualistic opening of a lodge, just as there is with a baseball game. Uh, with a baseball game, you know you're going to have the national anthem played. You're going to have um, usually the presentation of colors by uh, a civic organization, uh, a military group or a veterans group, or um, you know, the scouts, be it the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts. Some organizations probably going to present the colors. You're going to have the ceremonial first pitch. You'll have the national anthem played. Um, the lineups uh, are usually announced, if not uh, having the players run out to the field. So that's all this, the rituals and before a game even begins, just like we have our ritualistic opening of a lodge. Uh, and both serve a very important purpose. It's supposed to bring you to that spot. It's supposed to make you kind of forget about everything else in the world, make you focus on what's in front of you, think about something important, and then there it is right in front of you, be it baseball or the, the opening of lodge. Uh, and the same goes for the closing. Closing of lodge uh, kind of serves the exact opposite purpose of the opening of lodge, uh, kind of formal closing everything out that you've done and then kind of releasing you back out, uh, just like with a baseball game. Every major league team that I know of has their traditions. When the team wins, this is what happens. When the team loses, this is what happens. But you never just have a game end and everyone files out. It just doesn't happen. Um, so I know like for the New York Yankees, when they win, you hear uh, Frank Sinatra singing New York, New York as the fans are exiting. Uh, in recent years, they started playing that as well when they lose, uh, but not by Frank Sinatra. We'll have another artist perform it. Um, seventh inning stretch is another really common place where we see this happening. Uh, taking out to the ball game is across the country now. 
Uh, but we, see, we have other innings where, like the Red Sox, uh, they'll play Sweet Caroline. Or uh, in Milwaukee, you've got the Sausage Race. Uh, in Washington, D.C., where the All-Star Game is going to be this year in just a couple weeks, uh, we've got the President's Race. So there's those, those formal things, which even if they're not so serious, uh, they definitely are a part of the ritual of going to a ball game. Um, just like you'd expect certain things during your lodge meeting, you expect those things during the lodge or during the baseball game. Um, but if you really want to start diving into numbers, that's really where it gets interesting. Uh, especially if anyone's uh, a Royal Arch Mason, they'll notice a lot of uh, similarity between the baseball numbers, as well as what they uh, are used to seeing. But the number three, especially, shows up in baseball. Uh, there's three strikes per out, three outs per inning. Uh, three times three is nine. There are nine uh, innings in a game. Uh, and then nine times nine is 81. That's how many home games are played in a baseball game, uh, in a baseball season. There are 62 games in a current major league season. Half of those are home, half of those are away. Uh, so you have 81 games uh, there. So it's, it's really interesting just to see how many times number three will pop up during a baseball game. Um, it's also worth noting there are a total of 27 outs per team, nine innings times three outs, which is, of course, a multiple of three as well. Uh, so three all over the place. Right. What about the cultural impact of these two institutions? Oh, uh, th there's so many to talk about. Uh, when you have an institution as old as masonry, which in the United States is uh, older than our country, it goes back to colonial periods. And then baseball, we really see it from about the Civil War onward. Uh, but still, you can teach baseball or you can teach American history through baseball. Uh, so it's not a big surprise then that there's lots of cultural uh, implications from that. Um, watch TV for a couple hours. And if you don't see at least one baseball reference, I'd be surprised. Uh, with masonry um, and with baseball especially, if you look at idioms or you know phrases that may not uh, translate well into other languages, uh, you'll see a lot of those showing up both with a Masonic and a baseball origin. So knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, he was off base. Um, he went down swinging. All those are baseball idioms that we use on a daily basis. And Masonry has plenty as well. Um, he got a square deal or really gave him the third degree. So those are idioms that Americans use all the time that they may not even know that they have a Masonic origin. So it's really interesting to see that uh, in the most simple of ways on a daily basis, those two aspects of Masonry and baseball are showing up in our speech on a regular basis. Right. Well, let's talk a little more about your lodge in Cooperstown, Otsego Lodge. When was it founded? Uh, so Otsego Lodge was um, officially given its charter in 1795. Um, but it's worth noting that uh, masonry existed in Cooperstown even before then. Uh, so the first Freemasons that I know of to visit Otsego Lake, uh, which is right here in Cooperstown, uh, about a block away from the Hall of Fame here off Main Street and our current lodge as well. Um, so the first that I, could, uh, that I know of are uh, in 1756, Colonel George Krogan was Deputy Director of Indian Affairs. Um, 11 years later, he was raised a Mason. And just the next year, he built his home near what is today Main Street in Cooperstown. So this is before Cooperstown is settled. Uh, he's the agent of Indian Affairs for the United States, uh, or not, sorry, for the United States, for the British government. Uh, so he is uh, stationed here in this area, and he's supposed to be the kind of go-between between the British government and the, um, the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois Confederacy. Um, and uh, there's a marker on Main Street, just uh, if you're looking at the Hall of Fame's main entrance, it's just uh, a couple hundred feet to the left of the Hall of Fame. Uh, there's a marker uh, marking roughly where his home was. Um, also during the Revolutionary War, the American generals James Clinton and John Sullivan famously built a dam at the end of Otsego Lake and needing to move their 200 boats and roughly 2,000 men quickly down the Susquehanna River. Uh, use explosives to blow the dam and ride the floodwaters down the Susquehanna River about about 80 miles. Uh, so uh, pretty much the most famous aspect of the Revolutionary War here in Cooperstown um, and a pretty cool piece of American ingenuity. And Both the men responsible for that were uh, Masons. And their counterparts on the British side of that conflict were also both brother Masons. Uh, the British um, um, British officer Sir John Johnson and uh, for the British military, and also Chief Joseph Brandt of the Mohawk, who were the ally of the uh, British during the American Revolution, were both Masons. Um, 
it's worth noting that Chief Joseph Brandt was actually um, pretty famous for the, the massacre at Cherry Valley, which occurred, uh, Cherry Valley is only about a 15 minute drive from Cooperstown. And uh, rumor has it that uh, brother, um, brother Brandt, during the massacre of uh, the settlers in Cherry Valley, would spare anyone who had any Masonic symbols in their home. Uh, and uh, there's no proof of this other than hearsay, but it is interesting that it's pretty well documented during the revolution, any American soldiers that were captured um, would normally be, um, because of the commanding officer that Brandt had, who it's worth noting is also a Mason, uh, would condemn them to death for being traitors. Um, but Brandt, if a man uh, may, revealed himself to be a Mason, would actually ship them off to Canada when able to. Uh, but eventually, uh, word of this got back to his commanding officer and told him that all, um, all surrendered American, what we call POWs today, had to be executed as traitors to the crown. So uh, interesting that uh, right here in this area, uh, even prior to our lodge being founded, we have quite a bit of Masonic history. Uh, and pretty interesting, early American history as well, with Joseph Brandt and his role uh, both as kind of a, a good and bad figure uh, from the American perspective. Um, but anyway, so back to our actual lodge. Uh, Brother Elihu Finney arrived in Cooperstown in February of 1795. He was already a master mason at that point. And in August of 19, or sorry, 1795, so uh, from February to August, that's all it took, uh, he was issued a charter for Otsego Lodge number 40. Uh, the first meeting... Okay, we, 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 we missed, we, we had a little... Little freeze out there, so we missed who you were talking about. So okay, uh, I'll start back okay. over with uh, Elhu Finney. Uh, so Brother Elhu Finney arrived in Cooperstown in February of 1795. Uh, he was already a master mason when he arrived in Cooperstown, and just a few months later, in August of 1795, August 14th, 1795 to be specific, a charter was issued for Otsego Lodge Number 40. So it only took him a few months to get a charter here in Cooperstown. Uh, the first meetings were in a worshipful Finney's home. Uh, but the next year, 1796, uh, Brother Samuel Huntington purchased the Red Lion Tavern on um, what is today our Main Street, and that is where the Lodge had its meetings. And it's worth noting, what's quite interesting, is the Red Lion, uh, even though it wasn't named Main Street at the time, its address today would have been 77 Main Street which is the actual address of the current Masonic Temple in Cooperstown. Uh, so it's pretty cool that here we are 200 years later and we're meeting in the exact same spot, uh, even though it's not the same temple building. Um, so our first official temple in Cooperstown uh, was built just the next year, 1797. Um, March 7th of 1797, um, it was resolved that they would build a new lodge or a new temple and uh, it would not exceed 300 pounds I was a bit taken aback to notice that in 1797, we're still using pounds as our uh, uh, currency of uh, note, but uh, I guess that's what we were using here in New York at the time. Um, and uh, it was decided that brothers Sprague, Whipple, and Kellogg would build the temple, so we uh, contracted our own brothers to build it. And I'm blown away by this. Um, in March is when they uh, agreed to build the temple, and June 24th, 1797 is when the temple was dedicated. So it just took them three months uh, three months and two weeks to build the entire temple. Uh, my other lodge, not Otsego Lodge, but Delaware River Lodge, uh, just had a fire a couple of years ago. Uh, not too much was lost, but the building wound up being sold, and we're building a new lodge uh, temple, a new temple in Delhi. And I'll be honest, it's been a couple of years on now, and we're finally starting to see the structure come up. So I'm blown away by the fact they're able to do this in just a few months. Um, but yeah, so the building... Um, was uh, dedicated in June of 1797, and uh, we met there up until 1828. Uh, this is during the height of the anti-Masonic period, two years after the Morgan Affair. At this point, it was decided that no more meetings would occur at the temple uh, for the indefinite future. Uh, there was one exception to that, and that was in 1830 when an officer of the Grand Line, that's all that we know, Grand Lodge officer from the state of New York, came to visit Cooperstown. Uh, so they held that meeting at the temple uh, where they paid any dues and bills owed to the Grand Lodge of New York. And that was the last that they met there until 1845, and the last that they heard from the Grand Lodge of New York until a few years later as well. Um, but it's worth noting that during this time, though, um, there was a, a, um, another place where the Lodge met. 
Uh, so during those years of 1828 to 1845, uh, the lodge would meet in another location. They met once a year simply to elect officers and pay any bills. Uh, and this was just actually up what is today Pioneer Street uh, from the original lodge building. So if you're looking, uh, if you're actually standing at the original lodge building, which is still standing today as a private residence, and you look up Pioneer Street, you can actually see the current lodge building. Uh, and uh, because of a couple of buildings being in the way, you can't see where they met during the anti-Masonic period. But it's, it's just a few buildings up from our current building across the street, um, maybe 400 yards at the most from uh, one building to the other. Um, and that's where they met. And uh, we have no solid proof that this is actually where the lodge met. Um, this is known as an extension or the extension to the smithy, which is one of the oldest buildings in town. But on that extension, uh, if you look at it, you will see a um, man in a top hat built into the masonry. And you'll also see a trowel uh, built in the, um, the symmetrical section of the building opposite the main entrance. Uh, and inside that trowel, it appears to be a square and compass. Um, also, right in the centerpiece above the main door is the year 1826. Uh, there's a few reasons why that could be 1826, but it is curiosity to note that that is the year of the Morgan Affair, which really led to the explosion of the anti-Masonic movement in the United States. Um, so I know if I was traveling in Cooperstown during that period, I would assume that's where the lodge was meeting. And uh, we have no solid proof in our minutes because our minutes for that period don't include the location of the meeting. Uh, that's usually a standard piece included in our lodge minutes from the beginning, but for some reason during those years it was omitted. So um, the past Grand Historian for the state of New York and the past um, Otsego Lodge historian, Alton G. Dunn Jr., both agree that that is where the lodge met during that period, uh, despite the fact that we have no hard evidence to support that. But I think the symbolism on the side of the building is uh, enough to be sufficient evidence on my side. So I have to say I'm in agreement with them. Uh, it's worth noting it was Wilmer Brzee who was the Grand Historian who said that. Um, so in that temple, as I said, that um, the well, the unofficial temple, if you will, um, there is uh, those. There are those symbols present, uh, and that's actually currently being renovated. Uh, if you can see in the picture, uh, there's a tarp on the facade of the building. Uh, it's worth noting, though, none of those uh, apparent Masonic symbols have been touched in the renov renovation yet. Uh, so hopefully, those don't get touched. Uh, so after the end of the anti-Masonic period, uh, the the lodge decided they want to start meeting regularly again, not just once a year. Uh, so that was 1845. They continued to meet on a regular basis back at that first temple building back on what is today Lake Street um, or Lake Avenue, sorry. Um, and uh, they met there until 1847 when they were greeted by the senior grand warden of the state of New York. So about two years. And at that point, he demanded the charter of Otsego Lodge. Um, apparently during that period where they met once a year, they did not pay dues to the state of New York, uh, the Grand Lodge in New York, but apparently at the same time they did not receive any dues notices from the Grand Lodge, uh, so that's why they were not paid. Um, nevertheless, uh, the um, Lodge had been stricken from the rolls a few years earlier, the communication of the Grand Lodge in New York. So uh, the senior Grand Warden was there to collect the charter. However, an agreement was come to uh, because had the charter been given up, then all of the lodge properties would be turned over to the state of New York. As the law worked, uh, fraternal organizations and civic organizations could own property, uh, but if they gave up their charter or stopped, ceased to operate without selling their um, property first, that would actually default back to the state of New York. So uh, the grand, uh, uh, the senior grand warden agreed to help the lodge uh, reestablish a charter so they could keep their property. Uh, so they did establish a new charter, uh, and they were, uh, so their charter for Otsego Lodge number 41 was taken away, and they were issued a new charter June 17th of 1848 for Otsego Lodge number 138. Um, but what's interesting to me is what occurred just three years later, and that is gas lights were approved for the use in the first lodge building. Uh, I, I can't even imagine having gas lights in the building today, but uh, it was big news that they were going to have gas lights in the lodge building. This was a uh, October 1861, so we're talking right at the beginning of the American Civil War. Um, and uh, so in October, it was approved, and in the November uh, meeting, the second meeting in November, 
they had those gas lights. So it only took a month from the voting to put them in to when they got established, uh, when they got used. So again, I'm blown away by the time frame on this. I feel like things take much longer than that today. And they still only had two meetings a month like we do today. So uh, I'm blown away by the brothers of about uh, 100, 250, sorry, 150 years ago. Pretty impressive what they did. Um, but uh, during the, oddly, during the Civil War, we see an increase of membership of Otsego Lodge. They outgrow the original lodge building and have to buy what is our second lodge building, known as the Finney Block. And this served as our lodge building from 1865 to 1920. So uh, they still owned, it's worth noting, the first lodge building uh, while they moved into the new one. They rented out the, old, the first lodge building to other organizations in town, such as the Odd Fellows. Um, and so the lodge rented out the top floor of what's known as the Finney Block, named after uh, our first Warshall master, Elihu Finney, who was a printer in town. That's where he had his print shop. Um, obviously, this is past his lifetime, so uh, still known as the Finney Block, nevertheless. Uh, so they rented out those top rooms. And then um, in 1886, the lodge finally decides to purchase the building and uh, rented out the first floors to the United States Postal Service. Uh, and the lease for the Postal Service ran out in 1917, um, in 1918, which is the beginning of, the, of World War, or not the beginning, but uh, part of World War II. Uh, 1918, the Red Cross then rents out the first floor for their World War I efforts. And um, in 1920, the Lodge sells the building and moves across the street to what is our current building known as the Bunyan Block. So from 1920 till today, that has been our, our building, and that is at 77 uh, Pioneer Street, which was, like I said, our last meeting place before the first lodge was officially established at the Masonic Temple on Lake Avenue. Um, so I just think that's really cool that we've come back full circle to our, our second meeting place and the last one before we had a permanent home. Uh, and it's worth noting that uh, we maintain the building. We've owned it, like I said, since 1920. Um, and in 1941, there was a fire to destroy too much of our property. All of our records and our minutes were kept safe, so we still do have our original minutes. We still have the original Lodge Bible, which was printed in 1791 by Brother Elihu Finney. Um, so those were not destroyed in the fire, but the tenant that started the building, Ellsworth, or started the fire, Ellsworth and Sill, which is a clothing company, is still actually a tenant of ours uh, all these years later. Um, so they're one of three tenants that rent out the first and part of the second floor. Ellsworth and Sill, uh, Yastrzemski Sports, which is um, operated by a cousin of Carl Yastrzemski, and then uh, the second floor, which is a dentist office. So those three help us uh, maintain the building through through rent money. Uh, so that that's a whirlwind history of our different Masonic temples in Cooperstown. So, uh, so uh, what you what you. The history you've gone through explains the difference in lodge numbers, uh, why they all match and so forth. Yeah, uh, well, there is there is one thing that still doesn't quite match up. So when the charter was pulled from Otsego Lodge by the Grand Master, or sorry, not Grand Master, by the uh, Senior Grand Warden, it was Otsego Lodge number 41. Uh, a few years prior to that, um, on June 4th of 1819, at the Grand Communication of the Grand Lodge in New York, uh, they decided to renumber certain lodges. Um, I'm yet to come across why this happened. I have to jump into the Grand Lodge uh, um, communication minutes to find out exactly why. Uh, but yeah, so at Seagull Lodge originally was at Seagull Lodge number 40. And then uh, at the 1819 Grand Communication, our charter number was changed to at Seagull Lodge number 41. And then finally, uh, after the issue during the anti-Masonic period of Grand Lodge not receiving dues and pulling our charter, uh, we were reestablished immediately after the charter for 41 was pulled, a new one was issued uh, for Otsego Lodge number 139. So we've been in continuous operation since the original charter was issued, despite going through three separate numbers. Uh, so it is really confusing, especially if you don't know the history and you're looking at the different lodge numbers, uh, it can really confuse you. So let's take a look at a few pictures of your lodge. I understand the original Masonic temple is still standing, but has been used as a private residence for years. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So after uh, our lodge sold the uh, um, the temple, 
uh, it became a private residence. And of course, over the years, different uh, families have lived there. They built a deck on the back. It's gone through three different changes. But uh, most recently, it was owned by actually a member of our lodge. So that was really cool. Um, and uh, with him as the owner, we actually pulled out the original cornerstone, which has a nice uh, metal engraving, uh, all in Latin, about the, the dedication of the original temple. So that currently resides in our lodge's uh, club room on the second floor. Uh, in the current temple, uh, but it's nice that we were able to recover that because a brother owned it. Um, he unfortunately passed away this past year, and I know the house uh, is currently being lived in by someone. I didn't see it go on the market, so I don't know if the family just took over and are currently living there or, or what the case is, but um, yeah, so it's been a private residence since, and it's nice to know that up until this past year, it was actually the residence of one of our, our members, so it's really so, nice. So the nice, beautiful white house I see in the first picture that looks like it's got vinyl siding on it is it was the original lodge it is and actually it's not vinyl it's actually a clapboard it's clapboard okay that's cool mm -hmm. and then below that we have another picture of uh that it looks like it's on a steel plate or something yeah so there's there's actually two markers on that home uh one is uh marking as the original uh lodge uh, Otsego Lodge Temple here in Cooperstown, the first actually temple in Otsego County, which is a pretty large geographic area. Uh, so the first temple erected in the county. Uh, but uh, there's also a second one that was dedicated by, uh, that one was put up by uh, a brother. Uh, but the, the other one was put up by a graduate student. Uh, there's a, um, a program called the Cooperstown yeah. Graduate Program through SUNY Oneonta. Uh, and one of their students right. getting a master's in museum studies erected that uh, uh, plaque to commemorate the history of the building. So a lot of historic homes and buildings in the village have those little plaques. So then, then we go to the picture of your present lodge location. It's a pretty big, big brick building. It is, and it's centrally located. Everyone knows the flagpole in Cooperstown. That's right smack dab in the center of uh, Main Street. You have to drive around it, uh, and we are right there on that corner. Yeah, I see you. Uh, you, uh, you know, I'm looking at the a picture, and I see Yastrzemski Sports. Mm -hmm. As a Red Sox fan, you know, that. <laughs> how does that sit with New Yorkers? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, we're in Cooperstown, so uh, not everyone's a New York baseball fan. And uh, actually, interestingly, the uh, Red Sox are one of the top uh, most popular uh, teams in the area. They actually are more popular than the Mets in central New York. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you remember, from Cooperstown, oh, sorry, it's about the same drive from Cooperstown to Boston as it is from Cooperstown to New York City. So. Yes, uh, I understand. So the next picture we have is the second building in the Finney block. So all this you, you were talking about, well, we, we, did, we let, I didn't show the pictures at the time, but this is an interesting building too. This is sort of the concrete building we're looking at, right? Yeah, um, and that's where Brother Elhu Finney had his print shop. Um, so it still knows the, the Finney block. It uh, still has a little cornerstone there that says Finney block in the year of it's being erected. Um, but yeah, today there's, as you can see, some businesses operating in it. But yeah, so that was our, our uh, second official uh, temple. Um, and that's where we uh, originally rented and then bought the building. And this would be, I guess, the third temple we met in, but the second official temple that we owned. And then the next picture you have is you can actually see both of them. That One's sort of diagonally down the street from the other, right? The current lodge and the... the the other, the Finney Block Lodge. Yeah, so the, yeah, so it's uh, if you're looking, if you're standing like at the flagpole, looking up Pioneer Street, you'll see the current lodge on the right. Right. You can, see, you can see the Finney Block right next to it, and then just three houses up from the Finney Block is where we met during the Anti Masonic period. So from the very first lodge to the Anti Masonic period lot uh, temple, that whole distance is, like I said, maybe 400 yards at the most, probably less. Yeah, and let's, and let's go to that last one because this is the one you say they met at during mm -hmm. the anti-Masonic period. Um, and yeah, so that property was of that. That's right down the street, you say. 
Yeah, it's uh, three buildings up from the Finney block. Yep. And that was owned by a brother, Mason, during that time period. And, I mean, if you know a Mason owns it and you see those symbols, it's hard to dispute the fact that it's probably where they met. Uh, I can't say definitively, but since the grand historian of the state of New York has said that, I'll, I'll take his word on it. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's interesting, very interesting to see those symbols on the outside of the, the building. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, uh, describe the town of Cooperstown because a lot of us are interested in early history. Is it a small town or a city? Does it have one main street or is the Hall of Fame building in the downtown section? How does it, how close are the large buildings to the uh, Hall of Fame? All great questions. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cooperstown's extremely rural. Uh, we are located between the Catskill and the Adirondack Mountains. Uh, we're almost in, but not quite in, the Mohawk River Valley. Uh, so there's there's no real central geographic location that we connect with other than the Leatherstocking region. Um, the year-round residence of Cooperstown is about 1,800. Uh, so pretty small little town. Yes. Uh, and it is in the middle of nowhere. You really have to want to go to the Hall of Fame. You can't just say, oh, I'm in the area. I guess I'll swing by. Uh, the nearest city is the city of Oneonta. Uh, and Oneonta is not that large of a community itself. It's about 10,000 people. Uh, so most people wouldn't even call that a city. But for us, it is. Uh, <laughs> and it has uh, two colleges there as well. Uh, one's the State University. And one's uh, actually my alma mater, Hartwick College. Uh, but yeah, so it's pretty small, pretty rural. And um, we, uh, we have one main street. We actually have one stoplight in town. Uh, it's uh -huh. at, the, at the intersection of uh, Susquehanna, or sorry, not Susquehanna, the corner of Chestnut and Main. Um, and Main Street is really the main street. There's little side streets coming off that have a shop here or there, but really Main Street is the main street in town. Uh, the other real place where you'll see any sort of business um, would be on the state highways coming in or out of town. Um, but really, Main Street is where most of the activity happens. And uh, the address for the Hall of Fame is 25 Main Street. The address for the current temple is 77 Main Street. So we are on the next block down the street, not even a full block, because uh, we are on the corner and the Hall of Fame is uh, kind of in the middle of the block. You can actually see the globe lights outside of the temple. You can see those from the front porch of the Hall of Fame. Uh, so we're right there. And uh, from, any, from the Hall of Fame to any of the temples that we've uh, operated out of over the years, at most a three-minute walk. So uh, all very close to each other. I, I think you sent me a little uh, uh, diagram of where the lodges were in the Hall of Fame, was, and I'll, I'll put that in later. Great. Yeah, it's, uh, they're all real, real close. <laughs> really actually, the, close. Map, the map actually makes them look further apart than they are. Does your lodge today do anything with Major League Baseball? We currently do not do anything with Major League Baseball, uh, but it is worth noting that we do have a connection of current Major League Baseball. Uh, one of the members of our lodge and our current uh, uh, assistant grand lecturer, so one of our very worshipful brothers in our lodge, is actually the father-in-law of, uh, it's going to upset you probably a little bit, but Yankees reliever Tommy Canely, who's a uh, current uh, current pitcher for the Yankees. So that's kind of cool that we have that connection, despite the fact that we don't really do anything with Major League Baseball. It's also worth noting the Hall of Fame, while uh, has a very close working relationship with Major League Baseball, is its own uh, independent, not-for-profit organization. So actually, Major League Baseball and the Hall of Fame, they have a close working relationship, but they're not partners, necessarily. Um, they have no formal relationship. So. Um, I'd like for us to have some sort of connection with Major League Baseball, so if there's any current players watching, feel free to reach out. <laughs> when, when you have baseball, a Hall of Fame inductions, do many people come by to see the lodge? You know, they do. Uh, so our population, like I said, is 1,800, uh, but the population really swells that weekend. Um, the largest attendance ever for a Hall of Fame induction ceremony for our little village uh, in 2007, when Cal Ripken Jr. and Tony Gwynn were inducted, and the um, the number of people estimated at that induction is around 80,000. Uh, so lots of people in town. So obviously, with that large number of people, you're going to have plenty of Masons swing by. It's not uncommon for us to have someone leave a bit card under the door or reach out to uh, one of our officers through um, 
you know, through the, you can get the communication or contact information for the lodge uh, through our Grand Lodge website. So it's not uncommon for someone to reach out to us while they're visiting. I know recently uh, I met a brother from Pennsylvania who was up visiting, and so I took him around on a tour, and uh, we recently had a brother from Texas visit us while uh, he was in town. He actually was able to come to one of our, our lodge meetings, and uh, randomly on the street one day, I saw a guy wearing a, a jacket uh, with a square and compasses on it, so I went up and started chatting with him, and it was actually uh, the most worshipful Jim Mendoza from uh, the Grand Lodge of Washington, so uh, it's that's one thing I love about living in this little town. Uh, you never know who you're going to meet. And I mean, why would a, uh, a past grandmaster from a jurisdiction all the way across the continent come to a small town if it wasn't for the Hall of Fame, right? So it's uh, some, those are some of the great perks of being a member of the lodge here in, in Cooperstown. Well, that's just wonderful. Uh, Brother Nathan, is there any questions that I haven't asked you? Anything you'd like to bring forward that wasn't discussed? Uh, no, I think you've covered everything I really wanted to cover pretty well. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to uh, reach out to me to help in finding more Masons in baseball, I'd be glad to. It's also worth noting that part of my list of, uh, of my Hall of Famers, I did get two current Hall of Famers out of the research of Right Worshipful Kerry Cohen. Uh, he's a brother down on Long Island, also from the Grand, uh, Grand Lodge in New York. Uh, so he and I have been in email. I know he's got a team of guys he's working with down there. Unfortunately, I can't name all of them. Uh, so a uh, big thank you to him and all the, the all of his team down there on Long Island plugging away trying to find uh, more Masons involved in baseball. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Do, do you want to leave any contact information uh, for our viewers? Uh, sure. Uh, best way to reach out to me would actually be, uh, as, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I operate a, a, a clothing company, um, Two Pillars Apparel. So if you reach out to me, uh, twopillarsapparel at gmail.com. Uh, that's the best way to, to contact me, and uh, I'd be glad to hear from anyone. If you're going to be in Cooperstown, drop me a line, and if I can, I'd love to meet up with you and show you around. Yeah, we had a little freeze up there on your email, so repeat it again for everybody. Uh, two pillars apparel at gmail.com, and shoot me a line if you're going to be in Cooperstown or if you uh, want to do research trying to find more Masons in baseball. And if you're going to be in town, drop me a line. I'll be glad to hopefully meet up with you and take you around. Well, that's all for now. This is Frederick L. Milliken, Parting on the Square, Pots. You keep quiet, Sebastian. Excuse me, please. Sebastian, please. Don't interrupt my act. Sebastian. Oh, Mr. Borges, I, I didn't see the lights there. I forgot about them. What in the world are you doing? But why, I, why interrupt my act like this? Well, look, Mr. Borges, I, I mean, after all, if you're in a ballpark, they always sell peanuts and popcorns and things like that. I know that, Sebastian, but not in front of them. I, I beg, I beg your pardon, Frank. Ladies and please. gentlemen, and also the Thank children, will you excuse me for a minute, please? Thank you. What do you want to do? Look, Mr. Borges. Right. What are you doing? I love baseball. Well, we all love baseball. When we get to St. Louis, will you tell me the guys' names on the team so I go to see them in that St. Louis ballpark? I'll be able to know those fellas. Well, now, it's all right, folks. All right. Excuse me. I, all want, right. I want to find out the fellas' names. As long as it's okay I'm, with I'm the audience. I'm crazy about baseball. Uh, as as, uh, will you stand still? Pick up your hat. Go pick up your hat. Okay. Now, look. Then you'll go and peddle your popcorn and don't interrupt the act anymore? Yes, sir. All right. But you know, strange may seem they give ball players nowadays very peculiar names. Funny names? Nicknames, pet not, names. Not as funny as my name, Sebastian Dinwiddie. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Funnier than that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Now, on the St. Louis team, we have uh, who's on first, what's on second. I don't know who's on third. That's what I want to find out. I want you to tell me the names of the fellas on the St. Louis I'm, team. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Do you know the fellas' names? Me? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yes. I mean, the fellas' name on first base. Who? The fella playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? What are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you who is on first. I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yes. Well, go ahead and tell me. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base. Who is on first? Have you got a first baseman on first? Certainly. Certainly. Then who's playing first? Absolutely. When you pay off the first baseman every month, who gets the money? Every dollar of it. And why not? The man's entitled to it. Who is? Yes. So who gets it? Why shouldn't he? Sometimes his wife comes down and collects it. Who's wife? Yes. Mm. After all, the man earns it. Who does? Absolutely. 
Well, all I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first base? Oh, I'm no, to... no, what is on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? That's what I'm trying to find out. Well, don't change the players. I'm not it. changing nobody. Well, take it easy. What's the guy's name on first base? What's the guy's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. We're not talking about him. How did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? Stay off of first, will you? Well, what do you want me to do? Now, what's the guy's name on third base? Well, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. Well, I can't change their names. Will you please stay on third base, Mr. Broadhurst? Please. Now, what is it you want to know? What is the fella's name on third base? What is the fella's name on second base? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Third base. Woo! You got an outfield? Oh, sure. St. Louis has got a oh, good outfield? Absolutely. The left fielder's name. Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask you. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. Then tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? Stay out of the infield! Well, don't mention their names out here. I want to know what's the fellow's name in left field. What is on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who is on first? I don't know. Third, Third base. base. Oh, take it easy. Take it easy, man. And the left fielder's name? Why? Because. Oh, he's center field. He's center. Will you pick up your hat, please? Pick up your hat and Whoa. stop this. Oh, look, Mr. please. Mr. Broadhurst. Yes. Wait a minute. You got a pitcher on a team? Wouldn't this be a fine team without a pitcher? I don't know. Tell me the pitcher's name. Tomorrow. You don't want to tell me the date? I'm telling you, man. Then go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? What time tomorrow you're going to tell me who's pitching? Now, listen. Who is not pitching? Who is on? I'll break your arm, you say. Who's on first? Why well, come up here and ask? I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? I don't know. Third base. base. You got a catcher? Yes. It's a catcher's name. Today. Today. And tomorrow's pitching. Now you've got it. That's all. St. Louis has got a couple of days on the team. Well, I can't it. help that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Got a catcher? Yes. I'm a good catcher, too, you know. I know that. I would like to play for the St. Louis team. Well, I might arrange that. I, I would know. like to catch. Now, I'm being a good catcher. Tomorrow's pitching on the team, and I'm catching. Yes. Tomorrow throws the ball, and the guy up bunts the ball. Yes. Now, when he bunts the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out at first base, so I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right. I don't even know what I'm talking about. Well, that's all you have to do. Is to throw it to first base. Yeah. Now, who's got it? Naturally. Who has it? Naturally. 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 Okay. Now you've got it. I pick up the ball and I throw it to Naturally. I know you he don't. Is. You throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? Naturally. Okay. All right. I throw the ball to Naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Well, that's it. Say it that way. That's what I said. You did not. I said I throw the ball to Naturally. You don't. You throw it to who? Naturally. Yes. So I throw the ball to first base and Naturally gets no, it. No. You throw the ball to first base. Then who gets naturally. it? Naturally. That's what I'm saying. You're not saying that. Excuse me, folks. All right. I'm sorry, friend. I throw the ball to Naturally. You throw it to who? Naturally. Naturally. Well, say it that way. That's what I'm saying. Don't get excited. Now, don't get I excited. I throw the ball to first base. Then who gets it? He better get it. All right. Now, don't get excited. Take it easy. Hmm. <laughs> now, I throw the ball to first base. Whoever it is drops the ball so the guy runs a second. Mm -hmm. Who picks up the ball and throws it to what? What throws it? I don't know. I don't know. Throws it back to tomorrow. A triple play. Yeah, it could be. Another guy gets up and it's a long fly ball to be called. Why? I don't know. He's on third and I don't care. What was that? I said, I don't care. Oh, that's a shortstop. 